Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back again at the end of the week for yet another weekly market recap with my good friend, portfolio manager Lance Roberts. Hey, Lance, buddy, how you doing? I'm good. I got my. Uh, I'm in my bunker today with my hard hat on, so it's all good. <laughs> well, it is interesting. Uh, you wrote a, a a piece. We'll get to near the end here, but um, uh, showing a little bit more bear claws than you normally uh, tend to show on this program. Um, but it's kind of hard these days, right? Okay, so so starting here, the big news of today is uh, uh, on Friday, end of the week. Uh, midday, at least, the S&P bo broke below 39.50, which was the floor of the battle zone for control that technical analyst Sven Henrik talked about when he was on this program. And I know every technical analyst kind of has their own different, you know, exact numbers for where their levels lie and whatnot. But but you've talked about this range, right, where the S&P was coming down to essentially to 4,000. And it was going to kind of be decision time. Right. It was either going to bounce off support. So what was previously a ceiling would now be a floor. And if that if that does happen, that seems to be a pretty green light indicator, at least TA wise, uh, technical analysis wise, that the S&P will should not have a lot of uh, resistance running up to forty three hundred, forty four hundred. Right. So about a 10 percent increase. If it were to break decisively below um, Sven Henrik's line in the sand was thirty nine fifty. Um, and break below and, and, and close there and, and, and fail to hold support in Sven's eyes, um, he's thinking, hey, it, it could get to 32, 32 pretty quickly looking at, you know, kind of the technical bands that he looks at. Now, that's like a 20 percent drop from from where things are today. So today we did at least intraday drop below 39.50. It's been bouncing back and forth um, above that range, but it's still still, you know, below 4000, at least as we're talking here. Um, so we don't know exactly yet definitively uh, what the results were are, are from this, whether it's a true breakout or not. But from I'm, I'm assuming you're watching this really closely. And what is the tape telling you right now? Um, so a couple of things that, you know, are important here. So so again, you know, first of all, we, we've talked about, you know, back on February the 1st, we reduced our portfolio exposure by about 10, 11 percent at the time. Uh, head of the FOMC meeting because we were concerned both about the more hawkish language from the Fed as well as this, you know, problem with some of the economic data that was likely to come in hotter than expected on the inflation front, which is what we saw just this week, obviously, with the PCE data, as well as the uh, GDP price deflator, all coming in a lot hotter than expected. Um, so, so this correction was really, we had expected this. We had our MACD sell signals come in, told us that you know we are likely to have a correction in the market. Market didn't do anything for about a week or so. And um, you know everybody's like, well, you've got the sell signal, but the market's not going down. And, and it just takes time sometimes for that to happen. But generally more often than not, these sell signals tend to be pretty good indicators about you know, showing a decline in the market. So here, let me let me just share my screen with you now. And now, look, this is technical mumbo jumbo 101. So don't get too don't get too eaten up by this. Um, but this is this is a chart of the S and P 500, uh, really, and you know, kind of from the peak of the market last year to where we are currently. Some things that are, and we talked about these things several times, both in our blog posts on our website at realinvestmentadvice.com. I've talked to, about you with them here. Uh, this is just kind of a visual of it. Uh, this, this upper blue line is the neckline that started from the January highs to basically through those peaks every time we had a rally back in 2022. Um, the market from a bullish standpoint has formed what's called an inverse head and shoulders. And you can see these bottoms that were made by the markets. You had two lower bottoms followed by a higher bottom. And that's typically a very bullish sign. And when the market breaks above that neckline, that's typically a, a good kind of bullish sign that the bottom of the market has been put in. Um, we're nothing, nothing, despite the sell off this week, nothing is wrong with the market. Market had a big run since January, a bit of a correction here, not surprising. And we're sitting right on top of this rising trend line that we have from those October lows. So again, the market's not done anything wrong yet. Now, next week, that could totally change the dynamic, right? Next week, we could slice right through these and, and be looking to retest lows, and that will negate all this analysis. And that's 
that's the part of the risk of investing is that sometimes your analysis will tell you one thing and then the market will do something different. And that's why you have to be nimble and you have to, as we said earlier, have to call an audible. Uh, you'll have to change, you know, kind of change direction on what you're doing with your investment plan. And this is why I don't like passive investing because the idea of passive is just, you just kind of keep doing stuff and not paying attention to anything. Right. Markets tend to tell you kind of what's going on. So, you know, if next week we break through this, this kind of rising trend line that we have, well, the, the bears will now be back in charge of the markets. And we'll be talking about retesting October lows probably um, sooner rather than later. Now, that wouldn't surprise me with some of the economic data we've got coming in right now. Also wouldn't surprise me with some of the inflation data. If the Federal Reserve comes out and is more hawkish in their March meeting and hike by 50 basis points, which now there's an over 30% probability of that happening, that was zero last month, by the way. Um, you know, so tighter policy that's going to weigh on 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 markets, and then markets got to reprice for slower earnings and slower economic growth later this year. And so there's real risk here. And, and again, you talked about my article being a little bit more bearish. Um, there's some risk that is, is brewing, and I'm actually working on this weekend's newsletter right now. Um, that is called the. I'm, I'm going to read it real quick because it's on my other computer. Recession countdown begins as yield curves trough, and this is one. Of, and, and this is one of the. I'm going through yield curves and how they're often misread and misinterpreted. But the three month, ten year yield curve that the three month yield versus the ten month yield has now bottomed and has begun to improve. Yield curves tell you when they go inverted that you have the conditions for a recession. And we talked about this before, Adam. It's when they uninvert that you have the recession. And that, and those coincide with each other because at that point, the Fed is cutting rates, yields are dropping because you've got slower economic growth. And, and so you get that uninversion of the yield curve and it happens very rapidly. The three-month, 10-year yield, that uninversion of that, when that begins to uninvert, that's your leading indicator for the rest of your yield curves. So that countdown begins, and generally when that occurs, you're about six months out from a recession, sometimes nine months, but on average, it's about six. So there's some things happening now that suggest that the risk of a real recession is coming later this year or the beginning of next year. Okay, great. You just answered a bunch of questions. I was going to have, uh, keep keep your screen share here just for one second before we get off it. Um, so kind of what I heard you say is technically... You're not sweating too much right now. The the trend that we've been in, this rising up channel, uh, that hasn't been broken or invalidated yet. Right? right. So it sounds like you're not gonna you're not gonna really worry about a trend reversal until and unless we punch below um that that lower line that was rising from the right. left to the right by 45 degrees, right? And, and that's still there. And, and I just switch charts on you real quick because it's gonna answer the question you're asking. Um right now. This, the, this top indicator is our MACD indicator. You see it's so that cell has, has matched basically every top going back to January of 2022. And if I drew this line back, this chart longer term, you'd see the same thing. We're about halfway through that sell signal. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that markets have to go down just because you're on a sell signal. They can just basically chop sideways. In fact, if you look at this period from basically November through December, that's what the markets did. We went through a sell signal. Markets really didn't go anywhere for the entire month. And then we started kind of running off again. So we could see that type of action, to your point, that you know we hold the support level. Markets kind of bounce along. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be shocked at all if next week, Monday, Tuesday, we had a fairly decent rally in the markets. We've had a lot of selling pressure this past week. Markets are getting short-term oversold. So you get a little bit of a reflexive rally in this market. And so, but upside, as long as you've got this sell signal, upside on the market is going to be limited. So as long as the sell signal is in place, you sell rallies for the time being, raise a little bit of cash. And with a 5% yield in treasuries, money markets aren't a bad place. Okay. All right. So that's what the technicals are telling us. Um, yep. let's, let's get back here. Really. Don't, don't even get me to fundamentals. Those are worse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, look, I'm going to stop your screen sharing so we can that's see the faces here. Um, but that's where I'm going next, actually, um, a little bit as fundamentals, which is um, the danger here is that we could be seeing a change in market sentiment, right, where the market is waking up to the fact that higher for longer might be a real thing, 
right? So we, we, we talked about how coming into this year, all of a sudden there was all this talk of a soft landing. Over the past like week and a half, there was this trial balloon of like no landing, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> real, real hopeful thinking. Um, and, and now um, you mentioned that the, the PCE data, which is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation that they look more at than CPI, uh, it, it came in hotter than expected. It actually increased. Um, he talked about the GDP price deflator. Um, the market may be realizing here, um, and, and, and the, the, the data is showing it in terms of the future rate hikes that are being now priced in by the market. There are more than there were, you know, a month ago. So the market may be waking up and saying, hey, you know, maybe we actually really were kind of overly exuberant there. Maybe we got to ratchet down our expectations here. So that 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 is the danger here, right? Which is that the market all of a sudden makes a sentiment shift that then requires a repricing, correct? Yeah. Well, that, that look, that's ultimately... Okay, I, I, I got to be careful how to say this. So I don't want people to go running off thinking it's like, yeah. oh my God, man, it's just the good crisis is coming. Yeah. And I'm not yeah. saying that's what's going to happen. I'm saying yeah. that's a danger here, right? Yeah. And, and, no, and that's 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 the fact, right? And, and which is, look, there's two things that are going on right now. Analyst, the reason markets are running is for two reasons. One, as you said, that you know people have gotten this idea that we're going to have no recession. Uh, I just did Fox Business uh, News with Charles Payne earlier today, and Ed Yardini was on right before me, Yardini Research, super smart guy, uber bull, right? He's like Tom Lee, always bullish, no matter how bad it is. Middle I've been trying depression. to get him for this channel, just yeah. FYI. So. Middle, middle of a depression, he's bullish, right? So, <laughs> uh, but, you know, he's, he's he said, look, to 40% chance we have a soft landing and another 20, 25% chance that we have no landing at all, right? So basically, they're betting on the soft landing, no landing scenario. The problem with that is, is that all that economic data looking at is lagging and is now starting to get revised. So you're already starting to see the revisions to Q4 GDP. You're going to see big revisions to employment when you get those, those employment numbers in. There's some really big seasonal quirks that are going on with the employment data. It's not nearly as strong as what headlines suggest. Mm -hmm. And so, when all this catches up, see, so here's the problem for the markets. Now, I don't care what, look, recession, no recession, really don't care. What matters with that? <laughs> Excuse me. What matters is, is that if you have slower economic growth, that means you have less earnings. And right now, analysts expect that quarter one will be the trough in earnings and earnings will begin to improve through the end of this year. So, People are overpaying for assets right now. We have increased valuations from 27 to 29 times earnings just since December. And that's because price is going up, earnings are going down. And what they're hoping is, is that I can overpay for earnings today and earnings will catch up with me in the future. Right. The problem is, is that if you have slower economic growth, higher rates of inflation, um, you're going to have lower profit margins and you're going to have lower earnings and markets are going to have to ultimately reprice for that. And they haven't done that yet. That's the risk. Yeah. Okay, good. So yeah, you're validating my point. That is the danger is that the market really wakes up to the fact that, okay, we've just been thinking too optimistically, got to bring things down. Hasn't done that yet really much, but that's the danger here, right? Um, there's another danger there. And this is this is a really important topic. Um and I'm I'm going to try something new here, and I'll maybe explain it a little bit to people as we go along here. But I'm 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 going to give an alert. Um, it, it's something that uh, I've been thinking about doing, which is when something like really catches the attention of, of of myself and our financial advisory partners. And Lance, you and I talked about this earlier today. Even um, uh, you know we'll do our best to really wave a red flag and say, hey, this is worthy of your attention here, right? Um, I will send an email out to the uh, the wealthy on list about this, and when I do alerts in the future, um, I'll generally send them out uh, to the email list even before we talk about them on air. That way, there's no delay. You you know if if, if there's if something's hit alert status in my mind and, and those of our advisors, you'll be the first ones to know. Um, so the U.S. the one year U.S. Treasury now is yielding over five percent, right? And that that really is a game changer in the sense of you know the old decade long TINA acronym right there is no yeah. alternative to stocks right all of a sudden there you're going to get paid a pretty nice return for no risk right 
Um, and then, you know, and even if there's, you know, some breakage in the system and the Fed's forced to pivot, you also have the potential that, you know, you get a little bit of price appreciation out of that along the way if you want to take advantage of it, right? So um, the the reason why I'm sort of bringing this to alert status is I've talked with Lance, I've talked with the guys at New Harbor, I've talked with a couple of other people who you you see me interview on this program. And, and the majority of them are saying, you know, it's not often that the universe gives you as an investor um, you know, kind of risk free reward money. opportunities this rare. Yeah, I call right? it a free lunch. Pardon me? I call it a free lunch. Okay, a free lunch. Yeah, and I, I, I don't want to be that. But if you do, great. Um, <laughs> but, 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 ba but basically, um, you know, you've got this opportunity here for getting paid very nicely. Um, certainly relative to to what you used to get paid for such instruments. Um, and the opportunity for for price appreciation, um, and you can determine how much exposure that you want by going further out on the duration curve here, right? But if 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 you know, here's where we are, right? We're 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 getting paid a nice rate, four to five percent, depending upon what U.S. Treasury you're in. The Fed is is quite likely nearing the end of their hiking program, right? The odds that they go to six or seven or eight. Are, are, are relatively low at this point. Um, there's a lot of people out there. I'd even put you in this basket, Lance, that thinks even at five percent, you know, five five and a half percent, the odds of something breaking in the economy are pretty darn good, especially the longer the Fed holds us out there. And in this case, and I hate to position it this way, but like if you're sitting in these instruments, these treasury instruments, a, a breakage actually really helps you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because you're sitting in a very safe place, right? So you're not exposed to the risk that a lot of other uh, financial instruments would have. And quite honestly, in treasuries, that's where the capital is going to flee for safety. So the market itself is going to start bringing down yields. And of course, if the Fed is forced to pivot and the Fed is aggressively starting to bring down yields on the short end as well, you can get some pretty dramatic price appreciation, which you and I have already covered uh, earlier in, in earlier videos here, Lance. So you kind of have this great opportunity to get a good immediate paid return for you know, with 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 the safety of of the safest financial instrument that's out there, with this option value, uh, if indeed you know things uh, get get wonky and, and and rates start going down, and even if we're totally wrong, you know, if you buy a one year treasury or a two year or a five year, you just sit in it and you get a hundred percent of your principal back and get paid along the way. Like they're just this. Am I right in saying that these type of opportunities don't come along all that often in an investor's career? Yeah, no, they, they've come along. Look, I, I've been through a bunch of cycles, so has Michael. Um, but the, there's big caveats that go with this, and, and it goes back to investor psychology. Yes, you know, right now we have a free lunch and, you know, an opportunity. So, you know, and the problem is, is that you buy treasuries now, rates go up a little bit more, treasury prices come down. It's like, oh, I'm losing money. But to your point, you're going to get paid four or five, five. And look, there's corporate bonds out there paying their 6% right now that were what we call money good. And, you know, so you can get a very nice yield on your money. But here's, here's, here's the problem. though. So back in 2000, before the crash, so call it late 1999, early 2000, before the dot-com crash, CDs were paying 8%, bank CDs, and you could get bonds with a higher yield. Could not sell a CD to an investor to save my life because they were so used to getting 10, 11, 12, 15% of the market. Why on earth would I want an 8% CD? That is just losing money relative to what the market's doing. Of course, that 8% CD saved your ass over the next three years during the dot com crash. Right. At the bottom of the market, right now, during the dot com crash, yields did what? Yields went down. So at the bottom of the crash, nobody wanted to buy stocks. They wanted to buy 5% CDs at that point, right? Then they missed all the capital appreciation in the stock market going back up on the other side. So as, as their CDs matured, they were then selling those CDs to now buy an overvalued market heading into 2008. So right. this is the problem about psychology is that I've got no problem right now. I've got, I, I got, look, in our portfolios, we got a whole bunch of cash sitting in one to three months uh, maturities, one year maturities, um, yielding, you know, four and a half, five percent. And just, we're just holding that cash, but we're going to sell that cash 
and put it back to work in the market at the right time. We're just waiting for that right opportunity. So it's great that we have this alternative to go and, and, and park money at 5%. But there's going to be a much better opportunity to invest that capital. So just make sure that you know when to make that shift. No, no, no problem in hiding. I'm not saying there's any problem in hiding out in treasuries. It's a good place to be right now. Just be prepared. You have to make that shift at some point. Well, okay. So let, let's think tactically here for a minute, sure. right? And folks, this isn't personal financial advice. This is stuff that you should be talking about with your own uh, professional financial advisor. But look, we've got this rare moment of opportunity where the risk retort, risk reward ratio is is pretty Super Absolutely. attractive in this space, right? Absolutely. All right. So um, you need to determine as an investor where you want to play in duration here, right? And and there's nothing wrong with just sitting in the short duration and just milking, you know, the returns while they're being given to you, right? You're what, what you potentially miss out on is if we do have this repricing of yields and they come down, you're not going to ride the rocket ship that the long end of the duration curve is going to ride, right? Um, and, you know, in, in being on the short end of the, the duration curve, too, is really useful because when we see indicators that, hey, it's time to start bottom feeding, you know, in other assets, you can quickly get liquid and go do that. Right. right. So, you know, you probably want to have some sort of barbell strategy, right, where you've got some on the short end, some on the long end to take advantage of the long end opportunity. I'm going to put some words in your mouth and, and correct them any way you like, which is. You know, right now, it, 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 um, to to really take advantage of the long end, timing becomes pretty important, right? Um, and so we we know we get a great deal on the short end. Great, capitalize on that. You know, preserve your liquidity, all that type of stuff. Um, but as we begin to see indicators that uh, the, the the arrival of the recession and you know the the stuff that could force a Fed pivot is beginning to look more probable then maybe you can start sort of, you know, dollar cost averaging, whatever, starting to, to, to shift a little bit more and more to the longer end. And you already gave us one good indicator to look at, which was the, the 310 yield curve, right? right? Which is kind of giving us a marker where we are in the story, right? It's almost sort of like the fuse has been lit, right? That's great. Yeah. So, um, so you maybe don't necessarily want to shove everything to the long end of the curve yet, but you're thinking, okay, if in six months, you know, things should be a little more rocky, well, maybe I should put a little there now, just just in case things happen yeah. faster than I think. And then let me watch it every month to make sure, indeed, that the the clouds are darkening the way that I thought they were. Right. So is yeah, is that kind of a way to think about this? Yeah. No. I, I would. I if if I had if I had one hundred percent cash right now, right. So, um, and 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 out of the cash that I'm going to slate to my bond portfolio, I would buy some longer duration bonds right now, a little bit, right. So I'd have like so let's say forty percent of my portfolio is going to be. Um, you know, fixed income, put 10% of that in long duration bonds now, the rest of it super short. And then because because when this turn occurs, here's the problem with interest rates. Interest rates are like the stock market. They 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 take the staircase up and the elevator down. And so mm -hmm. by the time that you realize it's time to buy the long end of the duration, it's it's going to be moving so fast that you're not going to really have a time to buy it. It's, it's just it's going to move right past you. So, so you want I, to be positioned in advance. Do now percent of our portfolio the long duration bonds, the rest of it's super short. Um, as and 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 what we've been doing lately is we're now shifting our one to three month treasuries into one year treasuries, and then our one year treasuries are starting to shift into three to five year treasuries and starting to slowly move it that duration into that level. So as interest rates come back down and, and we're getting to the point now where we're probably pretty close to, to the peak in interest rates because interest rates are getting really, really overbought. They're an inverse to bond prices. So bond prices are very oversold. We want to start taking advantage of that. This is likely the last peak in rates that we're going to see. So this is going to be a good opportunity to start building out that ladder. But, but again, then I would also keep a portion of my money handy for distress credit opportunity. There's going to be some really great opportunities when things kind of fall apart at some point. Um, you're going to have some great opportunities to buy distressed debt, preferred debt, convertible bonds, corporate debt, because when, when, when interest rates start to reverse on treasuries, interest rates on corporate credits are going to spike because 
everybody's going to be concerned about bankruptcies and defaults and those type of things. If we get into a bigger bear market, that's really going to become an issue. So all bonds kind of get sold. It's baby with a bathwater type thing. So you'll see interest rates go up on all your corporates. Interest rates will fall on treasuries. So you'll then want to start moving from treasuries into corporates, convertibles, broken convertibles, distressed credit, good quality companies, of course. Um, but looking for those opportunities because you'll make a killing on that end on your bond side. And of course, you'll want to be buying equities as well at that point also. Okay. All right. Um, and again, none of this is personal financial advice, folks, um, but we're, we're yeah, just it's highlighting. All Adam, it. it's, it's all Adam's personal advice. Just take it. <laughs> yeah, <I laughs> gave me the script to read. So it's all him. <laughs> not, not at all. And, and we'll be tracking closely on this channel, folks. So you'll sort of know as our thinking evolves on this. But but what I wanted to really do was put this squarely on folks' radar in terms of the scope of the opportunity here and to begin to get people to think about the steps that you will need to take to take advantage of this if you decide you want to. One last question on this, Lance, which is, um, you know, the risk in the story goes out the further along you go in duration, right? So let's say you you just bought a ton of long duration treasuries. The risk is is that you're wrong, right? And that prices go, or sorry, uh, yields go a lot higher, right? Which push down the market value of your your bonds, and then you're you're stuck with, I mean, you're still going to get paid the the four percent or whatever the long end of the curve is paying right now um, for the next thirty years. But but you you know you either get to sell for a loss, or you get to hold on to this thing for the next thirty years, right? So that that that's the risk, right? Um, I think we think, you know, given where we are right now in the macro cycle, that risk isn't as big as it's been at, at, at other times. But hey, you know, we could obviously well, I, be actually, wrong. Actually, actually, that's a really good point because I got several emails from your viewers today is, uh, specifically on that issue, which is, you know, you and I have talked about this idea that interest rates are going to go lower. And they're like, yeah, but, you know, we have all this debt, so we're going to be the Weimar Republic. And that means that interest rates are just going to go to the moon because inflation is just never coming down again. And it's a whole new cycle. That's possible, but it's a very, very small possibility. Um, and that type of situation, the, the Weimar type Republic situation, when you get that situation economically, it's a function of three things. It's either a complete loss in the faith of the currency. In other words, um, we don't think the government will pay its bills ever again, right? And, and just they don't have the money to pay their bills. That's not true because we have a printing press. The, the dollar, you, you, we can make a whole argument about the, the problems with printing dollars, but we can always pay our bills. So we can take that argument off the table. The second is, is that we're losing a war. That's what was happening in Germany following World War I, the Weimar Republic. And when you lose a war, nobody really wants to trade with you. Nobody wants to do, nobody wants to have faith in what you're doing or what you yeah. have the ability to do. So that really impacts your purchasing power. Nobody wants your currency because it may not be worth anything because you lost the war. Um, and, and then thirdly is, is a complete breakdown in the rule of law, um, which also leads back to a loss of faith in the currency and these type of things. In the United States right now, and probably not in the next, it, look, could it, could these things happen in the future? Sure, we could go to war with Russia and China, and that would be a big, that would be a very bad thing. Um, but that's probably not going to happen today, and it's not going to happen next year, and it's probably not going to happen soon. Hopefully, cooler heads will prevail. If they don't, we got big, the, the stock market's not going to matter at that point anyway. So, <laughs> you know, bunkers will your matter. Your bunker and your beanie weenies will matter yeah, a lot more. Exactly. Uh, so don't worry so much about that. Here's, here's the real important point about yields and bond prices. Yields are reflective of three things. Economic growth, inflation, and wages. Now, the debt that we have in the country, both corporate, personal, government, you name it, student loan debt, all that. Debt is disinflationary, it's deflationary, right? Because in order to pay for debt, I've got to take money that I would have used to go purchase something in the economy to pay the interest service on my debt. So it extracts money from productive uses in the economy to service the debt. Again, I'm not saying debt's a good thing, I'm just telling you how it works. Yep. So the more debt you have, the more deflationary it is in the economy. And so if you go back to 1980, when we started really ramping up debt, interest rates, inflation, economic growth, and wages have all declined together. There's a very high correlation between those. So 
this current spat of growth that we have is due to all the stimulus money that we threw into the markets over the last couple of years that when checks to households created a lot of demand, no supply because we shut down the economy, created inflation. That's all now starting to come back down, which means that ultimately interest rates are going to track a decline in economic growth, wages, and inflation, which is all going to occur with a recession. So yields will come down. The the argument that yields are going to run off to the moon and I'm never going to get my money back again on bonds is not really probable given the long-term economic correlations between economics and yields. Okay. Um, Well said. Well said. Um, and, and underscoring, look, you know, kind of anything can happen still, yes. right? But what we sure. play to yes. probabilities, which is what we say on this channel, right? And probability wise, you're, you're very, you know, sagely saying, hey, look, that type of ending, that's a, that's a tail risk so far on the probability scale. If that changes, we'll flag for folks. But And, and, and trust me, if we're waving that flag, none of this is going to matter. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, look, folks, um, we'll, we'll wrap up this segment here on bonds. Um, two quick things, though. One, if, if if you still don't feel like you really understand bonds well enough to potentially take advantage of what Lance and I are talking about here, um, a really good way to get smart about bonds fast, if you haven't watched it already, is to listen to the free webinar that, that we did with Lance's partner, uh, Michael Liebowitz, a couple months ago on just understanding how bonds work. Um, Michael does a great job um, explaining what bonds are. Again, how the math behind them works, and then walks through kind of a number of the most common types of, of analyses that, that you do on bonds. If you watch that and take good notes, you'll totally understand everything that Lance and I are talking about here. So to go watch that, just go to wealthion.com slash bonds. Um, and very quickly, you know, I sort of mentioned that I was introducing this as an alert. Um if you like the idea of wealthy on kind of having an alert service like this, where when something like really catches our attention that we think you need to know about and potentially start thinking about how to take action on, do me a favor, let me know in the comment section, because if you do, we'll do more of it. And, and I have no idea how many alerts we'll issue. My guess is either only a few a year or maybe zero a year. I mean, it really depends on what's going on, right? But it's basically just when something really catches both my and our portfolio of experts' attentions, if you want to be one of the first to know about it, we'll officialize this alerts service. Uh, and if you if you want to get any alerts that we're going to do in the relatively near future, just sign up to the uh, the email list for Wealthion. It's super easy, totally free. Just go to wealthion.com slash email It'll send you to a page right near at the top of the page. It's just a little form where you can type in your email address and you can get you know, the emails we send people today, which are just basically, here's the latest interview we did. But if I send out an alert, I'm going to send it to that list too. Okay, moving on. Um, so you you gave a little nod to this earlier, Lance, um, <clears throat> but there's there's been some data out there recently that I think could be argued as as somewhat deceptive. I'm not saying necessarily intentionally so, but it might be giving people a false sense of what's going on here, right? So you talked about the jobs numbers, which you and I have batted back and forth every time they come out. And of course, the January ones were were bonkers and we went through all that. Uh, and the adjustments are already starting, like you said, that's saying, hey, wait a minute, they're not maybe quite as good as the headlines were saying. Uh, the retail sales numbers uh, came out uh, nominally and inflation unadjustedly positive, but when you actually look at them on a real basis, an inflation-adjusted basis, they don't look very good at all. And I did a um, a great uh, email, a great uh, interview with Stephanie Pomboy three days ago. I'll put up a link to it right here. Um, but Stephanie basically just takes a chainsaw to those numbers and explains why they are are not bullish numbers, uh, to put well, it mildly. Yeah. And there's a bunch of season. The problem I have is all these seasonal adjustments, right? We always these these we we're trying to smooth the data and do this and that and the other thing to it to try to pick up these seasonal quirks. And I, I've done analysis before. If you would just take the not the the unadjusted data, use a twelve month moving average on that data, it will smooth the data and it comes out almost exactly the same as all these seasonal adjustments, but it smooths out all this quirkiness to it. So. You know, but I guess the BLS has to justify their existence, right? Well, so it, the it, average would be too easy. <laughs> it, it, exactly. You know, with Stephanie, we, we we spent a lot of time looking at the BLS retail sales data. And then we, near the end of the conversation, looked at the Red Book retail sales data, which is just the data from cash registers, yeah. right? And it's just such a much cleaner 
and more accurate view of what's actually going on. You look at that, that thing is like, it's it's a steeper decline than a 45 degree decline since basically middle of last year, right? I mean, it tells an incredibly different story than all of the, you know, just, birth, just death, to, historically, heuristically adjusted BLS stuff. But just listen to what Walmart and Home Depot just said, right? So we just came out with, with retail sales for January, super robust. Everybody's spending money like crazy, apparently. Walmart says, you know what? Our customer base is slowing down dramatically. Um, Home Depot missed earnings for the first time since 2019. Look, these are your core home businesses, right? I mean, if I can't afford to hire, if I can't afford to hire somebody to come to my house and, and fix something, I'm hauling my ass down to Home Depot to, to figure out how to do it myself. And that's slowing down. So that so people are basically going, if it's broke, it's staying broke. Domino's Pizza, did you hear their earnings call this week? Their announcement was fantastic. Their guidance was terrible. They said, yeah. people are making pizzas at home to save money. If that doesn't tell you there's a problem, I even said this on my radio show the other morning. I said, pay attention to what Domino says. If they say, because my radio show is early in the morning at seven, so it's before the market opens. I said, pay attention to what Domino says today. If they guide down, that's going to tell you that we're heading into a more recessionary environment. And that's exactly what they do. And, and Lance, this picks up on something that you and I have talked about a lot over the past couple of months, yeah. which is that, um, you know, given inflation, right, that, that prices of a lot of things that were normal for consumers are now just getting out of their ability to afford them. We talked yeah. about the the $25 cheeseburger, the, the $33 BLT in my area, right? Where at some point the consumer is just going to say, I just, I either just can't do it, right? I literally can't afford something that crazy, or I'm not going to, it just offends my sensibilities, right? I'm not going to pay crazy yeah. amount for whatever it is, right? So the Domino's is a great example of that. And it's also a great example of kind of how far down the consumer chain we're doing, because I don't think Domino's pizza is nearly as egregious agree. as a lot of the other things that we've talked yeah. about. No, no, it, it's true. And it's just very interesting. I mean, you know, and, and this goes back to the data, right? You know, you get this data from the government and then you kind of look at the data on the ground. And, you know, this is my problem with the employment data, right? So the BLS has all these surveys and they do all these seasonal adjustments and nonsense to their data's birth death analysis, which is complete crap. Um, but we have companies that do this for a living, ADP, paychecks, about a thousand payroll services. I mean, there's a billion payroll services in the country. All you have to do is go collect that data. That I mean, payroll services are, I hired somebody this week or I fired somebody this week. I hired them part-time or they're full-time. They have all that data. There is no reason that our employment data is some telephone survey that we do on the first Tuesday of every month and call 60,000 households. It's just stupid. Why don't we just collect this real-time data? To your point, you know, we've got cash register data. Everything's electronic now. Nobody's paying in cash anymore. So we should have crystal clean economic data. Why we don't is beyond me, especially is the fact that we pay all these guys at the BLS more than $100,000 a year. Why we don't have better data is beyond me. Yeah, well, we've railed about this too, right? And the cartel-like <laughs> structure of of both the, you know, the corporate I know, cartel. I it's worth and, railing on again, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> and I still got a rant here, so don't worry. I'm going to let All you right. get wound up. Um, but, but my main point here is, you know, yes, there's this data out there that is sending what I think are deceptively false signals about the, the true reality of where we are. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that this is uh, the, the data is maybe as cooked as the, the jobs and retail sales data, but new housing starts were up in January um, and home buyer and home builder sentiment is ticking up as well. Now, not, not tremendously, um, but I know some people are latching onto that to say, oh, okay, well, look, you know, the housing bust is, is, is over then, right? Things are getting better. <laughs> and, and, and with the sort of cooked data and, uh, you know, people's willingness to just latch on to whatever they want to see. To me, it sort of has this feeling of the Roach Motel, right? Where it's like, it, it's this incredibly appealing uh, place that everybody wants to, to, to get into because they so want it to be true. 
but you know the roach motel is that roaches enter but they don't leave right is this the the building that everybody goes into that that becomes the towering inferno they all get stuck into and again that it's kind of the job of a bear market right it's to to get well, people to that level of of oh maybe it's over right yeah yeah no I, I think that's absolutely right I mean if you take a look at a lot of the data look a lot of the data has gotten look data like the markets gets oversold right um if you take a look at the Citigroup Economic Surprise Index, what that index is, is it looks at economist predictions and whether or not the data was higher or lower than what their prediction was. So if the data is consistently higher, they're being surprised. And so the index goes up. Um, but if you take, a, but data, when everything gets really kind of bearish, data will bottom and then it'll have some improvement. And remember that, you know, even in a, even in a bear market or even a recession, Adam and I are going to we're 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 really concerned about the economy, so we're going to cut back at the house, right? So we're we're not going to eat out, we're not going to do these other things, and we're not going to shop as much, et cetera. But eventually, even in the recession, we're going to kind of run out of stuff, and we're going to have to go kind of stock back up a little bit. So you know, go buy some toilet paper, whatever. And so, data doesn't go just straight down during a recession. It, and we've used the analysis of a ball down a hill before; it's going to bounce. So when you've had a really strong, you know, run of declines on a month over month basis, it shouldn't be surprising to see that bounce. And, and we're kind of seeing that bounce, but that's typically the setup for the next decline. You got to get a little, you got to get a little bit of optimism back in the market so that the bear market can kind of come crush them again. So um, if I'm right about yield curves, and this is this weekend's newsletter, uh, by the way. So if you go to the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, we'll have our newsletter out tomorrow. But we're going through yield curves and 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 interest rates and yields and those type of things and explaining why these are so important and what they're telling us now is that this little this is kind of like the, I don't know where you grew up, Adam, but I grew up on the coast and on the Gulf Coast, so I lived through several hurricanes, um, and and so like when the hurricane comes in, our house was like flooded three times and you know the whole nine yards, right? Um, but when a hurricane comes in, you get the first side of the hurricane. And then when the eye hits, everything goes to this lull. You've got blue skies. And you go, wow, man, it's all over. And then you get the back side of the hurricane, which is worse than the front side of the hurricane. So, you know, that's kind of where we are. We're in this little bit of a lull right now of this economic data. And if what the Fed is doing and they continue to do evolves into what has normally happened, the backside of that hurricane is still coming. So all this data is going to get worse before it gets ultimately better. Great. All right. Um, by the way, I grew up in coast New England. We did have our fair share of there hurricanes you. making yeah. their way up there. So I totally know exactly what you're talking about. And that eye comes and everybody comes out and they're walking around and you know, there's a sense of like, oh, it's over. And then, yeah, <laughs> bam, you get hit with the worst <laughs> side. Um, all right. Well, so, and again, you know, this, um, this data that may be giving people a false sense of the eye of the storm here, um, we are beginning to see, you know, a continued parade of data that is not good, right? And I want to, I want to, I just mentioned housing, so I want to share some on housing, and then I want to get to some that you guys had on your website uh, recently too. Um, all right, so uh, Redfin just announced that the U.S. housing market saw a 2.3 trillion dollar drop in value between June and December of 2022, right? That's the biggest since 2008. That is a massive amount of market value that's just been vaporized, right? And, and that's only through the end of last year. So we're gonna see what happens this year going forward here. Um, it's not looking great because mortgage rates are now back up to six and a half percent, right? You know, they were they were they they got down to the low sixes and everybody was beginning to say, hey, all right, you know, <laughs> maybe this is all over and we've seen peak mortgage rates. TBD, but the trajectory is back up closer to the heights that we saw uh, in the low sevens, and who knows where they're going to go from there. But basically, mortgages are still super expensive, given where they've been for the past decade. Um, uh, we talked about how sales cratered, you know, several quarters ago. Um, we're really now beginning to see prices catch up to sales. So I've got some some uh, uh, charts here that I'm showing as I'm saying this. Um, and it's not, it's across the housing uh, stock board. So um, for a little while, we were seeing declines more in existing home sales, price declines, but now we're seeing um, new home sale price declines begin to catch up uh, to existing home sales declines in terms of percentages, right? So there just doesn't seem to be a pillar of strength left in this market anymore. 
Um, and uh, for folks that are really interested in what's going on in housing, I just interviewed Amy Nixon. Uh, she's the uh, the woman I had on uh, the channel well, probably about four or five months ago talking about the Airbnb bust. Um, we have her on to talk about kind of the housing market in general. She also does provide a uh, an update on uh, the Airbnb bust situation as well, but that's coming out next week. So if you're interested in that, keep your eye out for it. Um, and it's not just housing. Um, the auto market, which we've been tracking you know relatively closely of late here on the program is really beginning to see some weakness too um used car prices started coming down new car prices had really been holding in um but we just had this uh tweet come out from um a car dealership guy who's a guy on twitter who is the ceo of a car dealership but it does so anonymously uh you know he tweets anonymously because he's basically sharing you know inside industry developments that the industry doesn't want him sharing and he's basically showing that uh the price of new Fords um has just all of a sudden started cratering um let me see if I can pull this up for folks here um he says I, I he's, he's found this from another uh peer of his I work at a Ford dealer and it's absolutely insane the new car pricing change over the past two to four months Everybody went from a $5,000 minimum over MSRP on nearly every model across the state to damn near invoice, meaning no premium on, at all on anything that isn't a specialty car. Um, and we accidentally priced a new 2023 Escape with $18,000 in dealer discounts. And some folks claim that we were still overpriced when we corrected it to a mere $6,000 off. Um, I can't speak for other manufacturers, but 2023 Fords are off to a crazy start. Um, so we're just seeing these cracks continue to get larger and larger in just core parts of the economy here. Um, last, I want to give you a chance to respond, but I just want to put up some of these charts that you had on your um, website recently, Lance, from Jim Colquitt, um, who is the CEO of Armor Index ETFs. Um, you had talked last week about how the Philly Fed uh, had a really disappointing print um, it was expected that it was the index was going to be down uh, minus 7.8. It was going to decline to minus 7.8. It declined to minus 24.3, which is well in recession territory, right? Yeah. Um, we've talked a lot in this channel about um, leading indicators. Uh, the U.S. leading indicator chart uh, still remains like solidly in recession territory at this point in time. Um, and then Jim had these two great charts. It's the same chart, just, just uh, edited. Um, he puts up the chart of the, the classic, you know, phases or stages of a bubble, right? And then he overlays the S&P over it. And he basically says, you know, it doesn't fit exactly, but it's pretty darn close. And you can see where we are right now. We're pretty much poised right at the start of the fear, capitulation, and despair waterfall part of it. So, you know, this is kind of cute. Who knows if it's really going to follow this way? But um, it's certainly worth noting. And you look at the macro data side of things, it's pretty easy to make the case that that chart may actually be predicting of the, the near term future. Yeah. You know, so two things real quick. Uh, first of all, just, uh, you know, Jim Colquitt's a great guy. Uh, used to work at Invesco AIM, um, went out, started this uh, firm called uh, Armor ETFs, which uses the sector rotation model. Uh, to manage risk and mitigate mitigate risk. So we're really happy uh, he's joining realinvestmentadvice.com as a contributor, but we're also going to be launching two portfolios that use his models. So we're going to have two new models that are doing sector rotation-based um, investing uh, using his proprietary algorithms. And, and it's going to be a really neat product. So I'm really excited about that in the near future. That, that's super cool. And sorry to interrupt, okay. but like, so if somebody's an existing... RA customer, what do they do? Do they just say, hey, I, I'd love to have some of my portfolio in that thing as well? Yeah, it'll, it'll be another sleep. Like, you know, we have our okay. bond sleep. We're, we're working right now with uh, your sponsor, GBI, to come up with a, a gold allocation to where you actually own actual precious metals inside of your account. We'll have a sleep for that. So we've got a lot of really cool things in the works that'll be coming out over the next few months. All right, cool. Well, as they get close to launching, we'll we'll oh, yeah, yeah. give you a chance yeah. on this program to really educate people to what's going on. But okay, great. So Jim, but, but, Cole, great new addition. But, yeah, it's a great new addition. But yeah, very. So, but there, you know, the key thing about that chart of investor psychology is is you have to say you have to make a determination: are we in a correction or are we in a bear market? If we're in a correction, and that's all this has been over the last year, 
Um, then, and, and look, we, we finished the year down about 19%. So again, not really a bear market when you think about it in, in those terms. If this is a correction, then markets should kind of get back on their feet and start going you know, to new highs. And again, a correction is, is just a, a pullback within a running trending bull market. And we can make a pretty good argument for that based on the long-term trend going back to 2009. Yep. However, if this, is, if this is the beginning of a bear market, and what we saw last year was the first phase of, now bear markets have three phases. They have a down, an up, and then the big down. Right. And that's according to Bob Farrell and a variety of other people, but three phases in a bear market usually. So last year was the down. This year so far has kind of been the up. And if we're going to have, and, and what we didn't see last year, we never saw fear and capitulation. Right. Uh, retail investors continue to pour money into index ETFs. They've been chasing meme stocks again this year. So we never saw that fear and capitulation. So if this is a bear market and if Jim is right about what he's saying, then yes, that fear capitulation stage is still coming. And that'll be that final leg down through the bear market where people just say, screw it, I'm done. And they even sell their ETFs. And when that occurs, that's where your great buying opportunities going to come up. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I do appreciate because uh, as, as much of the, the data as I've been pulling out here has been really negative and can give people a really convincing sense that, oh my God, it's all going down tomorrow. We don't know. <laughs> and we may still very well be just in a you know correction that that resumes the long-term bullish trend since 2009 or whatever. Um, we always have to, we always have to, from a portfolio allocation standpoint, be aware that 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 could very well be the case, right? Um, all right. So um but I do just want to say, in case we're not right, you know, <laughs> we're, we're we're at that point in the chart where it's like, we, it's, it's, should, it's make, yeah, it's make or break time. Yeah, we we should know relatively soon yeah. whether or not we're going to do yeah. this. And, and if we do, and I just want to underscore your point here, which is, yes, if 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 we go down this chart, it, it's not something that we want to be you know cheering on because it's going to be pain and suffering for for everybody. Yeah. Um, but as a long-term investor, when we get into the despair phase where people are just leaving all these assets out, you know, on the, the side of the street because they don't ever want to touch them or think about owning them again, that is a point where it, it historically has been one of the, or probably really the best times to be deploying capital for the long-term in terms of picking up really high value assets at great price discounts. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now we're going to do your rant, Lance, um, or <laughs> where I'll let you go. Um, and this was kind of, it's, 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 well, <laughs> we're probably telling people stuff they already know here, but um, uh, we got to a point near the end of 2021 where speculation, you know, just as, as, as much as we saw heights of it in the dot-com bubble or the housing bubble, um, where we just, we hit heights that probably were even unimaginable back then, just in terms of the fervor and in some ways, sort of just the mindless, magical thinking that folks thought that that stocks were going to go to the moon forever, right? Um, all assets were going to go to the moon forever. Uh, and so we had this sort of peak speculation, right? Um, it's It's been punctured. But to your point, um, you know, we we the, the hope that those days are going to return still lives strong in a lot of people right now. So you go through kind of the 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 echoes of the past that we've seen here. Um, you put up some of my absolute all time favorite commercials that I remembered watching. I, I love the E Trade time to time to rub the bunions <laughs> commercial. Uh, the be your own sugar daddy. I remember watching that live when it came out. Um, and that, was, and that, and that amazing enough, that was three months before the peak of the market in, in 2000. So, yeah, well, I mean, it, it was probably just a great marker of it. Right. You know, it was, it was capturing this the magical sentiment that we're all going to the, the tagline of that video was become your own sugar daddy. Right. We'll all become our own sugar daddies. Um, so, look, I'll, I'll let you describe, uh, you know, whatever key takeaways you want folks to take from that article. I do want to dive a little deeply with you, though, on um, the TikTok video. That you had in there, because to me, <laughs> it's just the classic top tick indicator of the era that we may be suddenly leaving. Yeah. So, so the, let's back up a little bit, right? So, I, I've act, there's actually a sequel to this article coming out um, that, that I'm working on, and and so this is kind of a 
so, so this is a, a, a reprint a little bit of an article I wrote in June of 2020. And I wrote this article in June of 2020. And I said, look, what's going on with retail investors right now is going to end badly. And, you know, this is when we were doing the whole, uh, you know, Reddit, Wall Street bets thing. And, and you know, they were going to get, well, boy, the retail traders, we're going to go get Wall Street. You know, they've had it their way long enough. And now it's time for us retailers. We're going to take over the world, right? And the point of the, that article then was, is this isn't new, right? We have seen this all before. And I've actually got Barron's covers, uh, the E-Trade e commercials in 1999 and 2007, and then the Barron covers in 1999, talking about the Wall Street whiz kids, which are these young kids that are sitting at home on their computer, because that's when we had 14.4K dial up, and you could dial up and trade on E-Trade. Um, and, and make money. We had, we had, and Adam, you'll probably remember this, but at that time, people would go lease out office buildings and they'd like lease out a whole floor of an office building and just put computers in it everywhere. And then people would show up and, and basically rent a desk and day trade all day. And that's what they were doing for a living until that all, that was 1999, uh, until that all blew up. So the, the point of the article is, is that, you know, while these young traders say, oh, boomers, they just don't get it. No, we get it. We understand this and we understand this type of a market. We also just don't know how it ends. Right. Because we were that stupid back then. <laughs> <laughs> We've done this. That's what I try to tell my kids all the time, right? As my kids do. It's like, honey, I've done that before. It doesn't work out well. You're, ah, you don't know what you're talking right. about. I do. Uh, but so the point of the article, though, is actually a Wall Street Journal article. And the reason and again, there's again, there's another part coming out to this one, I think maybe next week um, if I get it finished. Um, but the Wall Street Journal article is talking about some of these people that were speculating in the market. And they talked about this one kid in particular. He made a million and a half dollars in the markets. And then he was, you know, borrowing money on credit cards and he was living a lavish lifestyle and thought this would never end. He's now working two part-time jobs in Vegas, has 50 grand in credit card debt and is basically wiped out. Exactly what you would, exactly what the article I wrote in 2020 said would happen has now happened to a lot of these retail traders. The, the, the important part to follow up to this, though, is, is that now these retail traders are betting on this occurring again, and they're hoping the same cycle will repeat but not end again, right? They're now betting at this, oh, that was just an anomaly, everything will be fine going forward. Right. And there's a real problem why future, and we've talked about valuations before, but valuations say that returns over the next decade are likely going to be very low, somewhere close to zero. But strip all that out for a moment. Forget valuations. What from 2010 to 2021, the markets averaged 12% a year on average. That's four percentage points above the long-term average return of the market from 1900 to 20, 2008. So how did you get those four additional points of return? $43 trillion worth of government and Fed liquidity, zero interest yeah. rates, you, stimulus checks, right? The, so if the Fed is, so if the economy is fine, right? If everything is fine in the economy, inflation is coming down. If Ed Yardini is right, that inflation is going to come down, the economy is going to be fine. Why would the Fed cut rates? Why would the Fed just not leave interest rates at 5%? Right. Why would they cut? Why would they go back to QE? They would just keep reducing their balance sheet to get it back to 300 billion where they started prior to 2008. They don't need 9 trillion. So if, if, if that is the case, then where is the liquidity going to come from to drive markets higher with the exception of stock buybacks? Right. So corporations will still buy back their stock, but that's going to, that'll be one boost. Right. Although they but can't borrow this, as cheaply to do it as they used to, but yes. Exactly. And now that they're going to tax buybacks, that's even another problem. But so, so the point is, is that how are you going to, so the, the premise of the, the second part of this article is if you were betting this, this boom went to bust and if you're betting on a new boom, you're missing key ingredients for that boom. Okay. Great, great point. Um, and I think what I took away from the very end of the, the article was we have this sort of societal narrative that we've fallen in love with, which is don't be bearish. There's all this, you know, all these easy ways to make money. Right. And that TikTok yeah. video, folks, I, I, I can't play it here or else we might get, uh, 
and, you know, this, this video might get dinged uh, for, uh, you know, put in a penalty box by YouTube for, for um, IP uh, infringement. But you got to go to Lance's article and you got to read this thing. You got to watch this thing. I mean, realinvestmentadvice.com, Retail Traders Go Bust is the title, first article on the blog. But that the, the article, the, the video he's talking about on TikTok is these, this couple. And that's the most beautiful thing. They go, we have a guaranteed plan to make money in the stock market. And I'm going to give you their plan because it's genius. They buy stuff that's going up. That's all you need to know. And, and when it starts to not go up anymore, they sell it. Yeah. Right. And it's so easy. I mean, it's come on. Yeah. A, a caveman, so easy, a caveman. caveman can do. Can do it. It, it, so what yeah. kills me about that is, is so clearly these people have absolutely no, you know, background in, in true financial literacy. Um, but they are advising people who probably have even less background in it, right? Who are going to take this as sage advice. Oh, that's how you do it. Great. I'm going to go do that. And what kills me is, is there was a period of time where that really worked. And I, I'll even trust the guy. He was putting up screenshots of, oh my gosh, last month I turned $500 into $20,000. And I just did it again this past week with, you know, a thousand bucks I turned into 19,000, whatever, right? He probably did, right? Like there was a period of time where because of all of the deformation from all of the intervention that was uh, you know, going into the market that you mentioned earlier, Lance, you could do that. You know, I grew up, with, like I said, in the East Coast, there were times when the bluefish would run and you could see, you could stand on the shore and you could just see them. They were like piranhas. They were just snapping at, at, at these schools of fish that they would drive up near the surface. And if you're a fisherman, you don't even need bait. You just throw a hook into that. You're going to catch bluefish all day long, yeah. right? So there are these, you know, aberrant moments where, yeah, you can get a total windfall. And these guys, like you said, the, the, the assumption was just, oh, this is how it is, right? And uh, and of course, you know, the, 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 the social... Uh, danger of all that the social injury comes from when obviously it can't sustain and then everybody who's all in on that strategy just gets totally wiped out right but uh, so I, I took from your article you know look it's not don't be bearish there's just a zillion ways to make money easily in the world in this type of environment the right mantra to have in your mind is whatever you do just prioritize don't lose money right Make that your starting point. And if you can find prudent ways to get prudent gains in addition to that, great. But make your starting point be, what do I do to not lose money? And then secondarily, what are smart, prudent, risk-adjusted ways to maybe add on to that if I can? So, so the, the thing about losing money is very simple. Is fun, first of all, if you lose all your money, you're out of the game. So you can't play. You have no money. But getting back, the, you know, one of the things I see thrown a lot around a lot, by even by financial advisors, unfortunately, is, well, markets always go up over time, so you'll always get your money back. Getting back to even is not the same thing as making money. I had this long conversation. I tried to have this conversation with a guy on Twitter who would not listen at all. Um, but the point is, is that, yes, you can index into an S&P 500 fund and you can dollar cost average. And there's Nothing wrong. If that's you and that's what you want to do, that's fine. But here's how the math works that everybody, this is not discussed in the financial media when they talk about dollar cost averaging. If I take a dollar and I cut it in half because I lose value in the markets, and yes, I can buy more, <laughs> excuse me, I can buy more of that S&P fund 50 cents cheaper, right? And then I start getting back to even. Yes, I will get back to even sooner. But I haven't made any money. All I've done is destroy capital. And then I invested new capital just to try to repair the old capital. But here's what's missed in that analysis. Let's say that I, and, and over the first year, I lose 50% of my money. And then I get it back, all of it, the next year. Well, that's great. So I'm, I'm back to even after two years. I now have my, if my needed return to get re to retirement was 6% a year, I'm 12% off of my goal, 6% from the first year, 6% 6 from the second year, not including compounding. So it's actually even like closer to 13 yep. um, if I compound those returns. So now I not only have to get back to even, I have to make up for all those previous years of returns that I didn't get. Well, the next year, let's say I make uh, I make 13%. Okay, great. I've now recovered the first two years, but I'm still behind the 30. And, and this is the problem with losing money. You actually never catch up to where you were. This is why pension funds are massively underfunded. They they bet on these 7% year returns. They don't get them. 
And they're constantly behind the arc of where they needed to be fund wise to, to fund their pensions. And this is what's never talked about in terms of dollar cost averaging and these armchair couch, you know, kind of passive investing strategies. They really don't work in getting you to your investment goal. They're great for Wall Street because all you do is keep giving them money and they make profits right, right. On, on the money. But you're not really, it's not really working to your benefit of active, if you would actively manage your money and avoid the loss, it doesn't even matter if you beat the market on the way up. Doesn't matter at all. Market's up eight, you're up five. Awesome. Perfect. If you can just avoid the downturn over time, you'll beat the indexes. All right. Absolutely spot on advice. Um, I had a couple of analogies to throw into that mix, but in the interest of time and to spare people, <laughs> too many analogies for me, analogy overload, we're, we'll move on. Um, yep. I, I do just want to pull up one chart though from the article, which um, you're showing that because of a lot of this bad advice that people were given and, and the times that we're entering into, um, we're beginning to see real pain begin to manifest on the consumer is um, an uptick in serious delinquency uh, amongst all age groups right now. Um, but we're seeing it you know, the younger you are, the worse uh, your delinquency rate is here. Um, and part of that is the number of reasons for that. But but part of that is, is, is you know, I think the the quality of advice that younger generations were getting from these these uh, yeah. mediums like TikTok. <laughs> well, that's what that's what's really bad about this. You know, look, to me, for me to be an advisor, I, you know, I have to pass exams. Um, they're not hard, but you have to pass them. And then I have a regulatory oversight from the Securities Exchange Commission about what advice I give to people. And our firm acts as fiduciaries and all of our all of our advisors are either CFPs or CFAs or something, right? They're all certified. Um, and they go through a lot of rigorous training and, and education to give out the advice that they give. The problem is, is that unfortunately, you take a look at where young people are getting the vast majority of their investment advice. They don't get it from friends. They don't get it from family. They don't get it from financial advisors. It's all off the internet. And they're, you know, they're watching these videos of some guy telling you, oh, here's, here's my method for making a million dollars in the markets. And they're getting paid by YouTube for getting all their reviews. And that's how they're making their money. They're not really making their money investing, right? They're making right. their money by selling, you know, quote unquote, selling advice, which, you know, to me, if I did that, you know, I would be strung up by the regulatory agencies for that. So, you know, how these people are running around just giving out free advice that winds up really devastating people, you know, that needs to be regulated ultimately, and, and maybe someday it will. But, you know, if you're giving investment advice, you should have to adhere to the advisory regulations but people are getting their advice from these very dubious sources. And it's, unfortunately, it's cost them a lot of money and pain and sorrow. And, and I'm sorry about that. Yeah. And that's, you know, really kind of underscoring why we have structured Wealthy on the way that we have, right? Where we bring in a lot of experts who give you a lot of good insights and ideas. Um, and, you know, we encourage people to whichever ones make the most sense to you, put into action in your, your own portfolio. But Wealthy on itself doesn't give advice because we we aren't put through the rigorous standard that you guys are. And so that's why, it, and I know people get tired of hearing me say it every week, but that's why I tell people, hey, you know, unless you're highly experienced on your own, you should be working with a qualified professional financial advisor who understands all this stuff. And then of course, we have a few firms like you that we have brought yeah. into this experience and say, hey, look, you know, if you can't find a good one, go talk to Lance or these other guys, right? So um that is the whole reason why we've structured things uh, this way. Um, all right, look, well, um, oh, one other point on this thing too, uh, besides just the poor quality of, of a lot of these people giving, you know, random advice in, in these, uh, these social media and other channels. Um, the other thing that I just find so enraging um, is the gamification um, that goes on in a lot of these, you know, newer trading platforms like, uh, like Robinhood. Right. Um, which if you're not familiar with the term gamification, it is what it sounds like. Right. If, if you design a video game, it's done intentionally so that you're stimulating neurotransmitters and ejecting dopamine into people um, and, and getting them to follow a prescribed progression that you want them to do. Um, and make no mistake, that science has been brought in, in huge amounts 
uh, to other industries, but particularly investing and certainly in these new investing platforms that are geared to, to younger generations that are already kind of wired for this. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are just, you know, alerts and incentives and, hey, the, you, the stock you just bought, it just went up. Do you want to buy more? Right. There are all these things in there that just like a casino are trying to play to the worst weaknesses of these people to just try to get more and more of their money. You're nodding as I'm saying all this, Lance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I have I have kids that play video games. So, you know, uh, Call of Duty is one of the most uh, best selling franchises in video game history. And they make hundreds of millions of dollars. And, and but if you uh, I watch my kids play these games and you know, every day they have a set of challenges that they have to 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 meet. And if you can meet these challenges, you get a reward for this. And, um, you know, and, and that keeps you engaged and involved. And so you always kind of keep coming back because you got to keep doing the next thing. Well, if you really want to win, then you got to buy this special thing over here, uh, the special gun or whatever it is. To help you be a even better player, and 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 they have made a massive amount of money off this, and this is that gamification. It just feeds into that psychology of competition, so that as I, in, you know, but to your point, right? You buy this stock, and and Robinhood did this for a while, and they stopped it because they got they got a bunch of hammering for it. But you'd buy a stock, and then you get confetti all over your screen, or balloons would go up, and it's like, yay! You just bought a stock, aren't you so great? And you're right; it just feeds that psychological. Uh, impact and releases those endorphins and that dopamine and makes you just want to keep doing it more. And so you keep coming back and you keep checking the screen. Is it up or is down? That's the worst thing you can do for money. And, and this is the worst thing we ever did for investors, really, honestly, is, is when it started with E-Trade and it's only gotten worse ever since, you shouldn't check your portfolio every single minute of the day. It's the worst thing you can do. All the psychological biases that Adam and I have talked about in the past, you know, hurting and loss aversion and all of, you know, confidence bias, all this, it just feeds right into that. And you start making emotionally bad decisions. You know, if I, if I, if I had my way with my clients, I would sign them up. I'd turn all their crap off and say, call me in a year and we'll look at your portfolio. Right. (laughs) You know, and they would be, they would honestly, nobody would want to do that, but they would be better off they would be psychological happier in their life because they would go on about doing their life things, go to work, right. enjoy your family, do those things. Instead of being glued to a freaking screen all day, worrying about what your money's doing. And investing is a long-term thing. It's not one day to the next. In, in this whole thing about benchmarking the indexes and looking at your returns from January to December, it's all crap. It's all designed to get you to keep money in motion, which makes feeds for Wall Street. You're just getting fed right into the profit machine for Wall Street. Wall Street figured this out a long time ago, how to annuitize their business. And all these metrics that you're tied to were designed by Wall Street to generate more money for them, not necessarily you, because these all lead to very bad decision makings over time. All right. Well said. I got to pull you off this rant because I got to start winding things up here. Okay. I do want to get to your trades real quick before we do. Um, we check in usually on layoffs every week, and I just wanted to note the many that came up when I did a quick search right before we got on here. Um, Ericsson, the communications company, they're laying off 8,500 people. Ernst & Young and McKinsey are laying off. Uh, these are, you know, white shoe, you know, basically consulting tax firms. Um, McKinsey itself is laying off over 2,000. Uh, Meta uh, did a bunch of layoffs earlier this year. They're now planning an additional round of that. Uh, there's a ton of biotech firms that are in trouble. Several are laying off in excess of 50% of staff. One of them, Acorn uh, Pharmaceuticals, is firing everybody, so they're going out of business. NPR is laying off 10% of staff. Wells Fargo is laying off hundreds across its mortgage division. There are a lot more companies that I've, I'm not listing here. My key point here is just that this layoff wave is continuing. It's It's accelerating. But most importantly, the contagion is now well outside of tech, right? The narrative earlier was like, oh, these are just the overbloated, you know, big tech companies that can afford to shed some excess employees. It's not the real economy. This really is bleeding pretty, pretty badly now into the full economy. That's right. And, uh, you know, again, we talked about this before. It started in tech, but it's going to branch out as the economy slows down. Yeah. Okay, great. And and just uh, I mentioned this a lot in the past, so I won't go too much into it. But if you work for a paycheck, 
uh, there are steps that you should be taking now that can reduce your vulnerability to being one of the folks that are let go if your company has to go through layoffs. And if you do get laid off, there are definitely things that you should be doing. Some of them literally like in the first hour of, of learning the news. Um, we summarize all those in our free guide, the Wealthion uh, Layoff Survival Guide. If you haven't read it yet, just go to Wealthion.com slash layoffs. Uh, download it there, print it out. It's just an important resource for anybody who's an employee. They should just be aware of what those steps are. Um, all right, Lance. So what trades have you guys made, if any, over the past week? So yeah, a couple, if you don't mind, I'm gonna share my screen here just real quick, one last time. Just it's just interesting analysis of how we kind of how we come to decision making sometimes. Um, so this week we added two energy positions in our portfolio. And this is some analysis that we have on Simplevisor, and it looks at the relative analysis of sectors versus the markets. Uh, as you'll see, energy is now very oversold relative to the S&P 500. So if we drill down kind of into the sector itself, and, and it kind of shows this, this oversold condition that, that's there, um, it gives us kind of a good idea about where to start looking for potential opportunities and we can analyze very quickly the top 10 holdings of the energy ETF. And this week we added a position in ConocoPhillips because ConocoPhillips was even oversold relative to uh, its competitor, ExxonMobil. So when we looked at those two companies, as an example, we had an oversold sector in energy. ConocoPhillips was oversold relative to ExxonMobil and had corrected more with the market itself. So it was a very interesting opportunity with 5% yield to add to the portfolio. The other trade we did this week was with natural gas. Natural gas prices have gotten completely decimated here over the last few months. And we kind of talked about this previously is that, you know, everybody was chasing energy last year. And we warned you that that trade last year would not be the trade this year, most likely, because of just how markets rotate over time. And if we're having a recession, commodities are going to get under pressure. And, they, and natural gas has gotten hugely beat up since we made those comments back then. Uh, and so we were making a short term trade uh, with a company called EQT Corp, which is a natural gas producer. And uh, so we've added that. to It doesn't have a big yield. It's about a 1.8 percent yield. But fundamentals are really good. And there's about a 97 percent correlation between the stock and natural gas prices. Um, we like that stock. We have a bunch of questions this week from our Simplevisor clients going, well, why don't you just buy UNG or, or, or you know, one of the levered ETFs to trade natural gas? Um, we like the companies better. You have fundamentals, you have a dividend yield, but you have optionality in those particular ETFs. And so you actually wind up underperforming in ETFs that use options to track an index because of the decay of premium over time and the optionality. It's a big math thing you have to get into, but uh, <laughs> we don't have that issue with an actual equity. So that's when we bought EQT. All right, great. Hey, this uh, kind of layout is really useful, Lance. And I want to point something out. Maybe it's obvious to everybody, but we're sort of trained to look at uh, stock charts or, or financial information where we e equate red with prices going down and green with prices going up. You have kind of a reverse color scheme here, but it makes sense, right? Which is, okay, when something is getting oversold, um, that means it's likely going to revert to the mean, meaning it will likely go up in price over time. So as it as it falls more here on a relative basis, it gets more green, and obviously it gets more overbought. It gets darker red. Correct. That that is absolutely correct. And and so you know, and the great thing about this analysis is is that we also do a, a version of this. It's called absolute analysis. So you can actually look at the absolute score of an investment, um, such as, well, we can just take a look at, uh, say, ConocoPhillips as an example, and look at that relative to, uh, as an absolute score relative to the S&P. And that, see, that also tells us that ConocoPhillips is very oversold relative to the market. So, um, you know, it's just a great way to, to, to kind of step back. And, and again, technicals are great, but what we need to know is, is, is this a good entry opportunity? And is there opportunity there? And so looking at relative and absolute analysis can certainly help give you a better entry point. All right. And look, I know we're trying to wrap things up here, but <laughs> maybe it's worth really quickly, Lance, you just giving like a 30 second background again on the Simplevisor platform, because anybody can become a Simplevisor customer and get access to all these reports, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, this is our subscriber service that we've, we've had a lot of people that call us up all the time. And they're like, 
hey, we really love what you guys do, but I'm a do-it-yourself uh, investor. I'd like to do it myself. And that's great. And so what we've done is basically just provided individuals with all of our analysis that we do, um, you know, in our own portfolio management. And, and, and so, you know, you, you've got a homepage that it kind of covers what's going on with the major markets. Um, we provide all of our, you know, kind of analysis in terms of what's happening within the markets on a daily basis, um, overview of the markets itself. And then we also provide all of our, our research reports, our daily update um, is here, our trade alerts, whenever we buy or sell something, we provide our daily blog posts are, are put up here. We, we do uh, every Friday, we put out five undervalued stocks to take a look at. Um, our weekly newsletter we post here as well. All of that research that I was showing you a second ago is, is all posted here. Stock screeners. I mean, there's just a tremendous amount of, of stuff here to help you manage your money better. So if you are trying to manage your portfolio better, you need to have good research behind it. And so we provide you all of our tools for 29 bucks a month. 29 bucks a month. Okay. That was my next question. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, for, and, you try, and you can try it for 30 days for free. So, I mean, it's, it's, you, you know, try it out and if you like it, great. Okay. Uh, it's been a while since I've looked at the platform. There's a lot packed in there. Um, okay. So, but anyways, if you're interested, well, if folks are interested, where should they go, Lance? On uh, this? It's really easy. Simplevisor.com. Okay. Simplevisor.com. Great. All right. Um, so in wrapping up here, turn off the uh, screen sharing, Lance, yes, if you can. Here I am. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I just want to let folks know. So um, we had a uh, sort of celebrity CPA, if you will, <laughs> Tom Wheelwright on a couple of weeks back. Um, he is, uh, you know, Robert Kiyosaki's tax advisor, Robert Kiyosaki, the guy who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, Tom Wheelwright is his tax specialist. Um, Tom, I think if you didn't see that video, folks, you definitely should go watch it. Uh, it's exactly everything you dream of uh, in, in having an accountant where basically he's laying out all the different ways in which you can save money through taxes, but also, you know, talking about how it really should be a proactive process where at the beginning of the year, you, you know, meet with your, your tax advisor and say, what are all the things I could do this year to save more on taxes, as opposed to what we do right now generally is where we walk in at the end of the year to the, the accountant and we just, you know, dump a big shoebox full of receipts and say, hey, get my taxes done for me, right? There's, there's not much the accountant can do at the end of the year for you except just file the taxes, right? So anyways, uh, Tom is uh, really like literally he's he's the the best known, again, I'm not over exaggerating, he's sort of like the, the, the celebrity of the accounting world. Um, Tom is, is very generously made himself available uh, to do a live uh, basically ask anything, take user Q&A about tax season uh, for Wealthion viewers this coming Monday. Um, it's going to be at noon uh, Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so we'll have Tom for an hour and, uh, you know, I'll ask him a couple high level questions just to get him started about what people should be thinking about uh, now that tax season is upon us. Um, but if you've got any particular, you know, specific questions uh, around taxes, you're going to have one of the absolute world best uh, tax experts there. To answer questions, you're 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 pshawing all this, Lance. Why? Yeah, look, I'm just I'm gonna tell you right now how to save five billion in taxes this year. Okay, it's super easy. You set up a foundation. You call it the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You donate five billion dollars to it. You get a tax write off. That's how he saves all. <laughs> <the taxes. laughs> all right. Well, look. Well, then we, we, we're next going to do a, a accounting Q and A with Lance Roberts. Um, it's exactly. going to be sixty seconds long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but if you are interested in in the tax uh, live Q and A, uh, meet us on YouTube. Uh, actually, let me give you a URL for it. Um, I'll have to make this up afterwards. But wealthion.com slash uh, tax Q&A. All right, all one word. I'll put that up on the screen here. Um, you can go to that link. You'll see the countdown for the uh, for the meeting with uh, with Tom and it'll go live at 3 p.m. Eastern uh, on Monday, uh, 12 o'clock noon. Um, all right, well, look, um, I'm trying to think what else I need to remind folks of. Uh, there's still a couple days left of the early bird price discount for the upcoming Wealthy on Spring online conference. Um, but we're now getting just a couple of weeks away from that, folks. It is going to be amazing. I've actually uh, had to record Rick Rule's session uh, because he was leaving on a, a trip uh, to South America um, and isn't going to be able to attend live live. I got to tell you, folks, that discussion alone is worth the entire price of the conference. Um, if you want to walk out of this thing with actual like companies to go look at and research, particular stocks to go investigate, Rick just 
opened the kimono and shared absolutely everything. Um, so that was a wonderful conversation. Uh, and we've got just an amazing lineup, as you've heard me talk about on, on previous uh, videos on this. Uh, if you haven't heard me talk about it, though, you want the details or you want to register and lock in that uh, early bird price discount, just go to wealthion.com slash conference. All right. And now I'm going to climb up on my soapbox I do every week. Um, look, for all of the reasons that Lance and I talked about here, um, you highly want to be working, uh, unless you are, are a super experienced uh, professional financial advisor of Lance's caliber or better, which I'm going to say probably applies to 0.001% of everybody watching here, you should be working with a professional financial advisor who understands all the macro issues that Lance and I have been talking about, who understands all of the psychological issues and how we can be our own worst enemies here. Uh, can help you put together a, a, a customized portfolio for your particular needs and the current market outlook and can then execute against that for you, right? If you've got a good one, great, stick with them. But if you don't, or if you'd like a second opinion from one who does, maybe even Lance and his team themselves at RIA, uh, just go to wealthion.com, fill out the short form there to request a free consultation uh, with these advisors. It doesn't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with them. They're just going to do their best to help you because they're trying to help as many people as possible position prudently before what may happen from here. Lance, buddy, it's been another great week. Thanks so much for joining. I'll give you the last word. That's it. I'll see you next week. Hopefully, uh, we'll have a little bit of better trading next week. We'll see. Okay. And hopefully, we'll have some clarity about this battle zone for control, right? Hopefully, we'll Absolutely. have seen a big bounce and we can give the all clear or maybe we punctured through, but at least we'll know what to do. Maybe hopefully we'll be we'll be out of this just kind of wait and see mode that we've been in for the past couple of weeks. Fingers crossed. All right. Well, anyways, thanks so much, Lance. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.